that while you're standing, would you grab a copy of God's Word and put it in your hand and turn to 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to read, I'm going to read verses 24 through 29. I want you to read, a, read it with me. I'm going to read it aloud. You can read it quietly along with me. But we're reading it like this because uh, in Scripture, in uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, Ezra the prophet, he grabbed God's Word and he stood up on a platform much like this, although it says it was higher, and, and he read the book of the law to the people. And it says that he read it from, from the break of dawn until noon, so probably six hours. So first of all, don't ever complain about the length of my sermons, okay? Um, but it says, here's the amazing thing about what it says in Nehemiah chapter 8, that they stood at the hearing of God's word and they listened attentively. And so that's why I want you to stand and I want you to listen attentively. Now this is before I read it, I wanted to know also it said in that same passage that when, when, we got, when he got done reading for six hours, the people, uh, I'm sorry, Ezra blessed the Lord, some type of prayer, blessing the Lord. And then in that moment, and you can participate in this if you'd like, when he said amen, the people raised their hands high to heaven. And they said amen, amen. And then it says that they bowed down and they began to worship the Lord. Now, you may not be able to bow down. Maybe you want to kneel down. Maybe you want to sit down. Maybe you want to put your head down. I don't know how you want to do it. But I'm asking you, if you want to hear and, and feel and experience the Lord, let's just try to stay as close to God's word as we possibly can. And so I'm going to read that right now. And we're, going to, we're going to expect, we're going to read it expecting God to bless us in a abnormal way than we usually have here. 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 24, it says, So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship we enjoy the eternal life He promised us. I am writing these things to warn you about those who would want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit, and He lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit, the anointing, teaches you everything you need to know. And what He teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as He taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ, so that when He returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. Father God, we do bless you. and We thank you for being so good to us. We thank you not only for your presence, but we thank you for your perfect anointed word. We thank you, Lord, that you have preserved it through these long years so that we, as partakers of, of your grace, could could, could read your word and understand who you are and who we are in you and how it is that we're to live. Your word tells us that it's you, Father, who are seeking, seeking those who will worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray, Father, that tonight your eyes would stop here and see such worship. So, Lord, I ask that you would bless us during this time of study as we bless you and tell you now, all of us, that we love you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And so you just take your moment, however you want to do it. You can bow, you can kneel, you can sit, you can lower your head down, whatever you want to do, but get low.
just say this probably for the rest of your life. Feel free to not pay attention to me as I begin. If you want to stay right where you're at, it's totally fine. This uh, teaching here this evening will continue in our message called Need to Know, where the Apostle John has written to believers so that they would know they have everlasting life. And so we've been studying that uh, for quite some time now. Now, I understand that this message here tonight, this text that I just read with you, um, is kind of tough for some people. I understand that there are uh, Christians in every single culture across the world. They're all over the place. And I understand that all of us kind of differ in the way that we practice our Christianity, the way we read the book and see it a little bit differently, and I totally understand that. That's part of our identity statement here, our, 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 our uh, you know, that, that, that mission statement that churches have, and they list 20,000 things that they have to, you have to agree with to be part of that church, and ours is not like that. Ours just, just says that we understand that there's 7 billion people in this world, and they're going to read this book, and they're not going to all understand it or practice it the same exact way, and that that's okay. So we understand that there's some difference, okay? So I understand that in this culture, it may be difficult to, to, um, to get what I'm going to try to share with you tonight, but my effort, uh, I just want to say this, my effort has one purpose, and that is to stimulate a, a earnest pursuit of Jesus, okay? Not to lose hope, but to gain hope um, because you're going to engage in something, okay? And, and Americans uh, may have a hard time with this gospel, okay? Because Americans, like we spend trillions and trillions of dollars, including those that are Christians, we spend trillions and trillions of dollars. You can we spend trillions and trillions of dollars every year trying to make our lives easier and live a life of leisure. You know, we, we hire maids and cleaning services and we hire nannies and, uh, don't raise your hand, how about Roomba vacuums? Like, I don't, I, like, I'm getting one of those. Those are cool, right? The thing that just, you just tell it to go and it cleans your house for you. Every good husband should buy one for their wife, right? That is an awesome gift. Right, that they don't have to clean. I'm going to get one of those for my wife one day, uh, but we we do that. We get that because we don't want to vacuum, and we don't want to clean, and uh, we 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 get lawn care services because we don't want to cut our grass, and we have people detail our cars because we don't want to clean the cars. And and listen, Uber Eats. Not only do you have a restaurant now that you can have them cook your food and wait on you, but now you don't even have to leave your house to have it done. You just you just pick up your phone and dial it in, and they deliver your food for you. You can go to Walmart now and go on your right, go to your phone and, and tell them what you want, and they shop for you, and then you bring your car, and they come and they load it into your trunk for you because you don't want to shop. What about Amazon? I love Amazon. I, I was the fool. That would uh, listen. Every single supply that's in this church comes through Amazon. I used to go to, to Sam's Club. I get in the car, drive all the way up to Lady Lake into the villages. That's crazy to begin with, right? Go to the villages, go in, wait in line, buy a membership, sit there at the cashier, hauling all this big stuff, paying more for it, gas, time to go to Sam's Club. When all the while I just sit in my office and go, doo -doo 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 -doo, boop, and it shows up at the door. It's awesome, right? Awesome. We have smartphones, right? Who remembers their mother's phone number? Isn't that pathetic? I still remember my mom's phone number, but I don't remember any of y'all's phone numbers because I'm lazy. Heaven forbid I have a Rolodex or a little, little book next to the Granny used to have a little book, at her, right? She didn't have no smartphone. She had a little book on her nightstand with everyone's number in it because we're too lazy. We have a smartphone because we're too lazy to remember anyone's number. We have a smartphone because we're too lazy to go to a library. We're too lazy to look anything up. So we just go to Google. Boom, it's there. It's easy. It's quick. Leisure, right? And let's be honest. You don't have to raise your hand. Isn't it, don't we just text because it's just a lot easier than actually calling somebody? It's like too much bother to actually sit and talk to Joe. I don't want to be bothered with that, right? So I text him because it's easier, right? Guilty as charged. 
That's the way that we live. It just takes too much effort for all these things. And so listen, this type of chosen lifestyle here in America, this chosen lifestyle for an American Christian loves a God and a gospel that does everything for them. And so when you hear a verse like the one I'm about to read to you, let me just say this, I absolutely agree that it's true, but in the right way. Ephesians 2.8 says that salvation is a gift of God, not of works. True. But to the broken person, they love that because to the broken person, the idea of I don't have to do a thing sounds very, very appealing. And it fits right into this chosen lifestyle of ease and leisure. Now, before we dive into what we read in 1 John, let, let's just talk a little bit about this salvation, okay? How, how you get it, from who, all that kind of stuff. Let's just talk, let's get clarity on, on salvation. That's the biggest thing in the church, right? That's what it's all about. Salvation, forgiveness, salvation, right? So it is a gift, it's not of work, okay? I 100% agree. Here's the issue. The problem I see, just me, in the church, in America at least, is that there's this false dichotomy that's formed. They have two camps. Grace or earn. Grace or works. And somehow the two camps cannot find a way to harmonize the two. And I listen, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I, when I read the Bible, I see perfect congruency. I see a perfect dance between the two. And I see them coming together in such a way that is absolutely beautiful. And I want to try to paint that picture for you tonight the best way that I can. So let's talk a little bit about this salvation, okay? Hebrews 9.22, very, very important verse. You should all know it. It's important. It says, without the shedding of blood, it, 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 there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin, okay? The forgiveness of sin, which is your salvation, right? It's, 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 it comes through payment, not behavior, okay? It comes through payment, not behavior. Now, did, was Jesus Christ, was his behavior perfect? Yes, it was, but that's not what saved you. His blood saved you. Something has to pay. So down with this silly notion that God will be so pleased with our morality and our kindness, so blissfully taken aback by our lack of lying and cheating and drinking and cussing and, and sexual immorality, that he will, he's going to say, well, you know what, your good outweighed your bad, so you're in. Okay. God's word never, someone say never, yeah. never teaches that, ever. But what God's word does teach is that God is holy and that God is just, and when we breach his standards, punishment is required and payment must be made. No ifs, ands, or buts. Listen, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin, that's your payment. That's what you get. You go to work all week, you get a check. You sin, this is what you get. The wages of sin is death. Payment must be made. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ. We'll talk about the gift in a moment. But it's clear that there, there must be a punishment. He is holy and perfect and just. And when you break his rules, because he's holy and just, he has to punish you. He has to punish or else he's not one to be trusted. He's not one to be believed. If he says, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. If he doesn't do it, he's not to be worshipped. He has to do it. He cannot lie. He must keep his word. That's who God is. So God says, sin requires blood. Now I'm sure that if you took a worldwide poll of this, most people, especially here in America, wouldn't like that rule. I, I don't like that rule. Who likes that rule, right? Why is God so mean? Why is he, why is he so insecure that he needs this? Why is he so, right? Here's the problem with that kind of thinking. You're not God. And it's his universe, right? So because it's his universe, it's his rules. You're not God. So, so here's the gift, and I can, I'm going to give you one verse. I can give you many. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God showed his great love by sending his Son to die for you while you were a sinner. This is a great way to describe the gift that God gave you, right? But here's this one, Romans 3, 25. This is the one I, want, I chose. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. 
People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Did you get whipped? Did you get beaten? Did you get spiked? Did you, did you die? Right, not one drop of blood, was it? But Jesus did. Jesus did. Here's your gift. He gave you that gift. And you didn't, what did you have to do to earn it? Nothing. Nothing. This is remarkable. Jesus Christ, the one in whom all the fullness of deity was dwelling. The second person of the Trinity, God in flesh. He gives his own blood to pay for your sins and buy your forgiveness. This is amazing. You earn hell, he gifted you heaven. You earn blame, he gifted you forgiveness. You earned death, and he's gifted you eternal life. Awesome? So, so here's the gift. Here's the gift. And what did you have to do with it? Nothing, right? Was it your, any of your blood in here? Was it your life or your body in here? Whose was it? But who would like to have it? Raise your hand. Come get it. Come get it. There you go. Awesome. But here's the problem. Did you just do something? You did something, didn't you? She did do something, didn't she? See, many people will teach you that you do nothing. God does everything. He saves you. He does everything. You're a passive recipient, and you do nothing. Salvation is of the Lord, which it is, but you have to do something. When you reached out, when you got up out of your seat and you reached out your arm to grab the gift, didn't you do something? I'd say you did. Doesn't your outstretched arm and your open hand ready to receive and grasp the hold of that gift mean you, you made a, a choice and an action? Weren't your will and your body engaged in that moment? Didn't you do something? Didn't accepting the gift mean that you, in that moment, made a choice to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Didn't you make that choice in that moment to make Jesus Christ the Messiah, the Savior of your life? So you did do something. And so we need to, we need to get rid of this confusion about works. Okay, We need to get rid of the confusion about works because we are lazy people by nature. And so when it says it's not of works, that means I don't have to do anything. Don't do anything. God will do everything. You have to do nothing. That's what's taught. Listen, we, this is so human. He says have a drink, we abuse it. He says have food, we abuse it. He says have sex, we abuse it. Every, that's just what we do. So when he says you don't have to do anything to earn it, we're like, okay, then I won't do anything. And so this lazy gospel is perpetuated across the world and you're not doing anything. And where's the earnest pursuit of the Lord in that? Nowhere. Nowhere. When Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, the church was born. First thing that happens, he, he shares Jesus with everyone. Then he say, listen guys, you don't have to do nothing. Jesus will do it. Just, just sit right there. Because he preached the gospel to them and, he said, and, and they said, brothers, what do we have to do? Do. And what did he say? Did he say, well, you don't have to do nothing. He said, no, you have to repent. That means you have to change your mind about life. You have to change your mind about the way you're living. You have to change your mind about sin. That means the stuff that I used to do and thought it was okay, I don't think that anymore. I'm making a conscious decision of my will that my way is wrong and your way is right. So he said, repent and turn to God. Isn't that something you have to do? Do you just sit there and do nothing and by osmosis, his Holy Spirit just goes all over you and you're changed? No, you have to do something. You have to receive and accept the gift by repenting and turning to God. So not by works doesn't mean you don't have to do anything. Not by works means that there was no preparatory work on your behalf that you did to receive it. He did everything. 
It means you didn't purchase or earn your forgiveness. Jesus did with his blood and his death, not yours. That's what it means of a salvation, not of works, but of grace. That doesn't mean you don't have to do anything. We need to get rid of that. That's not a saving gospel. That's a weak, fake, phony, empty gospel that's going to lead people to hell. That's not what we want. Now listen, this letter that John wrote was written to people who had already received the gift. They had already, it says it many times in the letter, I'm writing these to you, who believe in him, who made the decision, who's actually won their fight against the enemy. I'm writing to you who are believers. They had reached out and have already repented of sin and turned to God and embraced Jesus Christ by faith as Lord and Savior of their life. They had made that decision. And so this, this teaching here tonight, this highly concentrated teaching about this matter, like it's not isolated in Scripture. And before we dive into that, let, I just want you to see something. Like this type of teaching that he's teaching here about that you don't, there's no such thing as not doing anything. It's all through the New Testament. You have a piece of paper that you were handed, I hope, when you, when you got here tonight. Who needs one? Who didn't get one? Okay, there's a couple back here. Kim's bringing them to you. I want you to read these. This is just, look, I have tons more. But this is a sampling of, of, of New Testament scripture that, that, that absolutely harmonizes with exactly what John is preaching here. Listen, when you grab one text out of the Bible and say it means something and it's not congruent with the rest of the Bible, that is not for doctrine. That's, that's proof texting. That's not, but when it's all throughout the Bible, like constantly, then you understand. This is, this is the measuring stick that we measure all isolated verses against when it's completely rampant through the, the New Testament. So, this is what I'm talking about. Okay, you, you're a Christian now, right? Awesome, you're a Christian. Look at it says, Hebrews 3, 6. We are God's house. Anyone encouraged by that? I'm happy about that. If we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. Well, that's a big if, isn't it? See, a lot of people think, hey, once you're in, once you get saved, you're saved. That's it. You're saved. You're in the house. You're in the body. You're part of the bride. You're a son or a daughter. You're a co-heir. No problem. But that's not what Hebrews 3.6 says. Hebrews 3.14. For if, we, if, there's that if word again. If we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. That's another big one, too, right there, right? If. And, of course, we don't have to, be a, we don't have, to have like a 20-year seminary degree. We don't have to have a master's in divinity to see that what's the opposite. Okay, well, if I'm not faithful to the end and I don't trust God as firmly as I did when I first believed, then I won't share in all that belongs to Christ. When we've been told you're a co-heir with Christ. Awesome. But here's the here, here you gotta you gotta stay there, man. You can't just go, oh, I'm a co-heir with Christ. Awesome. I get to live life the way I want, because I believed him on, on Tuesday, March 17th of 1986, and I believed, and, I, and maybe you did. Maybe you did. I'm not doubting that you did. But he says you gotta keep on going. Hebrews 6, 11 through 12. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and what? Endurance. Endurance. Colossians 1.23. Now, on my piece of paper, I forgot to put this down, but it says on yours, I believe, something along the lines of that you were once enemies of God, separated from him because of your, your evil thoughts and actions, but that through Christ's death on the cross, God has brought you into his very presence, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. Amen? That's awesome, right? Who believes that they're without fault? Nobody, right? We're all sinners. We all, we've done a million things, right? But because of what Christ did, no, don't, don't miss that. Not because of what you did. Because of what Christ did, 
God brings you into his presence, and, and because Christ was awesome, and because Christ was perfect, and because Christ died, he now sees you through the filter of his son Jesus, and he says, hey, that Tom, man, he's perfect. And all the while, like, God's not dumb. He's like, yeah, I know Tom's not perfect. But I'm going to view him that way, positionally, because of what Jesus Christ did. So he says, he's holy, blameless, and without a single fault, if, and there it is again, and it's not taught. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded, steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. In our New Living Translations, it says, you're holy, blameless, without single fault, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance of the good news. Colossians 2, 6. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as Lord, what does that mean? One day, you were convicted. You realized you needed help. You realized you had a sin problem that you couldn't fix. And somewhere along the line, someone shared that good news that Jesus would do it for you. And so you bent your knee and you said, okay, Jesus, I give up. You're the boss. I'm not. I receive you, Lord and Savior. We're, it's a done deal. And he says, so just like you did that that one day and you bent the knee to Jesus, so you must continue to follow him. You can't follow him for a season. You can't follow him for 50 years and then, then neglect him for 10 years. Not, that doesn't work that way. He's not grading on a curve. He says, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as Lord, you must continue to follow him. Matthew 24, 13. This is Jesus Christ the Lord speaking. But those that endure to the end shall be saved. And what's taught all the time, and it does not say this, that those that endure to the end have been saved. They'll say, well, if they get all the way to the end, still believe, and that means they had a true conversion experience because the real converted person will never leave. Because he's been sealed. That's another false teaching. Sealed as in locked in. No, 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 no. Look up what it really means. Look it up in a concordance. It means sealed with wax and a king's ring. I've identified. You can't, that doesn't mean you can't open up the paper. You've been identified. That doesn't mean sealed as in locked in. It means sealed, identified. Those that endure to the end shall be saved. You know why he says that? Because the fullness of your salvation doesn't happen until glory. You get saved the day that you bend your knee. But you're also being saved along the way. Glory to glory, glory to glory, delivering you from situations, becoming more and more like Christ. But then one day, at the fullness of his reign, then you're really 100% done, saved, locked, sealed, forever. In glory with him. That can't change. That's why he says, they shall be saved. Well, I thought I already was. You are, but not totally, because there's a day coming. Where you get to be with him in glory forever. That's the fullness of your salvation. Again, Jesus Christ, John 15, 4. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. But I thought you were doing everything, Jesus. Yeah, I am, if you remain in me. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. And that's why he says anyone who, who's in me, who doesn't bear fruit, my father will cut them off and throw them into the fire to be burned. People are not being taught this. So there's a complacency in the body of Christ. There's a lethargy in the body of Christ because we're not, we're not eagerly trying to produce fruit for our king. And all the while, the scriptures say if you're in him, which means you're a Christian, but you don't produce fruit, whoosh, into the fire. I'll let you figure out what that means. 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith. Pause. How do you abandon something that you never had? Someone please tell me that. They were never saved, really. How do you abandon something or some place you never had or never were? Because I, I haven't figured that one out yet. 
It says here that they will, in last days, they will ab- some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Listen, every one of these calls, including the first John text that we're reading tonight, they are, they are not calls to initiate a proper relationship with God. All of them are calls to continue in proper relationship that you initiated when you got saved back in the day. Right? And, and listen, 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 listen. This is super important. This thing called lordship salvation gets a lot of grief. Oh, you don't have to call him Lord. He doesn't have to be Lord. He doesn't have to be Lord. He has to be Savior. He has to be saved. Listen, listen. The Bible says in the book of Acts that God has made Jesus both Lord and Messiah. And, 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 and the Romans wrote, which is what everyone uses to lead people to the Lord, Romans 10, 9 is where it always ends up. And this is what it says. If you confess Jesus as Lord and believe that he died for your sin and God raised him for the dead, you'll be saved. You must confess Jesus as Lord. What's that mean? It doesn't mean that you believe he's Lord. It means that you believe that he's your Lord, right? You have to confess that Jesus is your Lord. Let me tell you something. If you don't confess that Jesus is your Lord, it doesn't matter. He is Lord. And nothing will ever change that. You don't dethrone him. But if you want to to reap the benefit of who he is, then you need to confess that he is your Lord. Okay? So that's part of getting saved. Okay? So John, get back to our text, John, he's super, super clear in this very concentrated section of this teaching about remaining there. Four times in this short text that I read with you. Four times it says remain. Remain faithful, remain in fellowship. Some of your translations, you might be reading another kind of Bible, like in King James or something, it'll say, it won't say remain, it'll say abide. It'll say abide faithfully, abide in fellowship, okay? So I'm going to like tone down the preaching for a second and just do a little teaching instead, okay? So we're going to just, you got to study the word. It says to study the word, right? Rightly divide the word of truth. You got to study, meditate on it, know what it means, right? Don't just, just roll through it real quick and say, oh, I finished this book. Go on to the next one. That does nothing. Okay. In, I think it's in verse 27. It says that the, that the anointing or the Holy Spirit abideth, abideth in you. But then he goes on and says four times that we have to abide. Listen, there's a massive difference between those two words. They're the same root, I get that. But they mean two totally different things. And you don't know that if you just read it. You've got to look it up in, the, in like a concordance to find out why, it, it, why does it say, what word did John use here specifically? If the word of God is all inspired of the Lord, God breathed and useful to teach, then we should study every word to know what it really means. So we could what? Worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so the word abideth is a present indicative verb. Okay, this is the... I think this is the first time I've become extremely boring. Like extremely boring. It's a present indicative verb. Remember, John is writing to people who are believers. He's writing to saved people. You know this, right? I'm writing to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so you might know you have everlasting life. He's writing to followers of Christ. And so at present... If you're a believer, the present indicative of abideth means that at this moment, if you truly are a Christian, then the anointing of the Holy Spirit lives in you. That's what it means. And that's a great place for an amen. That's great. If you're a believer, awesome news for you. But that's a different word that he uses for, the, for you and me. He tells you and I to abide, not abideth. Abide is a transitive verb. That means it's ongoing, it's moving. It means to last, to persist, to stay, to continue without fading. It's the Greek word meno. It means to stay in a given place, to stay in a given state. That doesn't mean Georgia. It means like, um, I was in a state of shock, right? You know what I'm talking about? You heard that? I'm in a state of shock. I'm in a state of, 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 of disbelief, right? You've heard these expressions, right? 
And what this word would mean is stay there. Stay in that condition, if you will. Stay in that mindset. But most importantly, the word is defined to stay in a given relation. To stay in a given relation. So to abide in fellowship and koinonia in partnership with Jesus and the Father means, Jesus, you are Lord, you are God, you are Savior, I am not, I will obey, I will submit. You would say that the first day, would you not? And then you would say it the next day, and you'd have that same position, that same agreement, that same partnership with Jesus that day, the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, the next decade, enduring to the end. That's what abiding is. You following me? Have we achieved total clarity? Does anyone not understand what I'm saying? It's huge. Like a wedding forever. Hold your peace. Now, show of hands, would we all admit that these components saying, you, Jesus, you are Lord, you are God, you are Savior, I will obey, I will submit, I am not God. Aren't these necessary components to being saved? Would you agree? Raise your hand. So why is it that somehow this teaching that says we have to, we have to get there to get saved, that somehow it's taught that maintaining this proper partnership by what you have to do is somehow a salvation of works? How does that make sense? It makes no sense to this person. It makes no sense to John. He makes a command. You must remain faithful. That's, what, that's the command. It's right there in the text, right? And then he follows it up with a, with a condition. He says, you must remain faithful. And if you do, then you'll enjoy the eternal life that's been promised. So again, we don't have to have a master's of divinity to, to understand the flip side. If you remain faithful, you enjoy eternal life. What happens if you don't remain faithful? Oh, look at that. A brilliant theolog theologian right there. It doesn't take a degree in the, in the Bible to understand this. Simple truth. If you remain faithful, which again, to those that would teach, God does everything, you have to do nothing, why would he tell you that you have to remain faithful if it's already being done? The one who began a good work will continue to do so till the day of Christ Jesus. You don't have to do anything. Well, then why is he telling you to remain faithful? That makes no sense, does it? See, somehow you've got to make that, these, these, these verses harmonize. I can. Because the Bible tells us to let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. To let the Holy Spirit lead you in every part of your life. See, he will continue to, to do a good work in you to the day of Christ Jesus if you let him. So you have to let him, right? You have, and, 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 and those that get saved, that have the Holy Spirit, they're not going to want to abandon. They're not going to want to walk away. They're not going to want, really? Because I have a, I'm looking at a room full of, of, of saints that are sinning all the time, including the one in the mirror every day. I'm not condoning or saying that it's good, but isn't it true? Now, the Holy Spirit's going to, if you're really saved, you're not going to have that same kind of nature anymore. You're not going to want, really? How do you explain yesterday then? <laughs> Come on, man. It just doesn't make any sense. It's, a, it's an easy gospel that doesn't save anybody. He says, if you remain faithful to what you were, if you, oh, I'm sorry, remain faithful to what you were taught from the beginning, from the beginning, from the beginning, you know. Let's think about that. Um, there's a lot of things you probably were taught way before you got the gospel, right? You're, does he mean, remember how to tie your shoes? I, mean, I did that before I learned the gospel. Um, remember how to, to do your multiplication tables, although I never even remember that one. I mean, there's lots of things that we learned way, 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 way back. But well, what's he talking about? The beginning, the beginning, the beginning. Well, it's, you might have heard a lot of things about God, but at some point, the thing that really started this thing, that, that caused a beginning, is that somewhere along the line, you heard about all this stuff about that you were a sinner, and Jesus came to, to pay for your, for your sin, and if you embrace what he did on the cross and make him your Lord and Savior, that you could be saved. And he says, if you remain, he says remain faithful to what you were taught. You have to remain, why is that? Because verse 26 tells us that people will try to lead you astray. 
Right? Isn't that what 1 Timothy said? Isn't that what Paul told Timothy? Some are going to abandon the faith. Some are going to abandon the, What did it say? I'm going to make sure I say it right. The Spirit clearly says that in later days, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. People will try to lead you astray. They will, some translations say, deceive you. Some translations will say, seduce you. They'll, they'll woo you from your first love, right? Isn't that what Jesus told the church in Ephesus in, in Revelation chapter 3? He didn't say you never loved me. He didn't say you were never my church. No, he said you did. But you've lost your first love, right? And that's what he's telling us here. Some are going to try to seduce you. They're going to woo you, you know, to the happily married woman that, that Rico Suave comes in and says, Hey, baby, how about me? And she goes over to him, right? It works both ways. And this is what's happening. People will try to deceive you, and the enemy will use people to try to deceive you from where you really were, to woo you away from your first love. And if, if, if everything is done by God, and you're totally secure in Him, and it can never be changed, why is He telling you this? Why is it even in the Bible? Is it a waste of print? I think not. And so again, not only does he command us to follow faithfully, but in verse 27 he says that the Holy Spirit, he didn't change you so much that you can't turn your back. No, he says that he teaches us to remain in him. Why would the Holy Spirit teach you to remain in Christ if the opportunity to never leave him is no longer available? Does that make any sense to anyone in this room? But it's taught all over the world. And I don't understand that at all. <laughs> How about this? Why is it, if you're so secure in him that you can't lose the salvation, that he, that he changes your nature so much that you would have no, the, the thought of even going elsewhere is, is gone. You've been changed at the molecular level. If that's the case, why is the entire New Testament, whether it's Peter, Paul, Timothy, uh, Luke, John, anyone, why are they constantly telling you what to do and not to do? If, if he's totally, ch the one who began a good work, well then why is it saying, let no unclean word come out of your mouth? He's going to change your vocabulary, you don't have to work on that. No, he works on it when you work on it. And he gives you the strength of the Holy Spirit inside of you to, to get, to, to lean on, to help you. He's teaching you to do it. He's convicting you of sin. But, he, but he's not going to make you stop cussing. Guess who has to choose that? Raise your hand. You do. Let no unclean word come out of your mouth wouldn't be in the Bible if God is going to automatically subtract that. Oh, I almost, almost cussed right there. Wow. <clears throat> it was a church cuss. I was going to say crap. Okay, so then, you know. But, but. But why would, he, why, why, why would he tell you not to say it if, if the Holy Spirit's going to do all that for you? You just got to sit back and relax and be still and know that I'm God. There's a time for that. <clears throat> all right, so let's take a look at this last remain here. Verse 28. Remain, 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 remain. And now, dear children, remain. You didn't hear me the first three times. Here it is again. Remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you'll be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. We read a verse a little while ago, Colossians 1, 22 or 23 or something, where it said that you are a, he's brought you into his presence, holy, blameless, and without fault. I don't know, I just read those words and then I... I line that up with when he shows up that I'm going to shrink back in shame. Does that make any sense at all? I, 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 don't, I don't see. What, why, would a, why would someone who's, who's eagerly pursuing the Lord, loving the Lord, keeping his commands, rocking it with Jesus every day and night, just can't, I can't wait to be in heaven, right? But then, but then when he shows up, oh, I'm terrible, I'm rotten, I can't be with you. Does that make any sense? So, let me, let, me, let me just confirm this teaching with another section of the Bible because it doesn't matter what I think. And I could give... And I've been, this is probably the most 
when, when I got saved, when I, when I got saved, I started hearing preachers, and I, started, and I was reading my Bible like crazy, and I started hearing them preach stuff, and I'm like, yeah, that's not what this says. And this thing right here was the big one for me. This was the big one for me. And so I got tons of it. I've been studying it tenaciously for years, 15 years now. And so I just got verse after verse after verse after verse after verse of all this stuff. But here's one, one last one, because we can't sit here all day and night. But here's one last confirmation of what I'm talking about, just so you can see that it's not just an isolated part of Scripture. I want you to turn back like two pages to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 3 through 11, okay? So it's a little bit long, but just bear with me, because you guys love God's Word, right? Okay. So um, 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 3 through 11, remember this, he says, um, when he comes back, you don't want to shrink back in shame, right? Like that would be what would happen when Jesus comes back. Listen to what 2 Peter chapter 1 says. Um, so uh, in verse 3, it says that uh, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. That's a great place for an amen right there. That's awesome, right? Everything you need. What does that mean? He gave you his Holy Spirit. He gave you himself. Like, this is like an amazing ability, an amazing power, an incredible resource that you have. He gave you that. How did he give it to you? We have received all this by coming to know him. When you come to know Christ, he gives you his Holy Spirit, right? The one who called you, us to himself, by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Now, when you just stop there and read just that, doesn't it sound like he's going to do everything for you so you can live the divine nature and escape the world's corruption? Doesn't it say that? Anyone? Because of his promises, right? It's because of that that you're able to do this. That's what we read, right? But watch. Here's the dance. Here's where you have to do something. Watch. I've done this. I've given you the power. You can escape the, the, the world's corruption, share in his divine nature, in view of all this, make every effort. Whoa, human responsibility? Whoa, man. So if I want to receive these promises, then I actually have to do something? I don't just get to sit there and let it fall on heaven, from heaven to me? No, I actually have to do something. Watch. In view of all this, Make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Who does that? Who decides in your life whether you're going to sleep around or not? Raise your hand. You do. Right? You do. I can't decide. I can get up here and preach and tell you that it's wrong. But at the end of the day, you have to decide you're not going to do it. Right? <clears throat> I read a moment ago about, I didn't read it, but I just quoted it about letting no unclean word come out of your lip. Can I make you not cuss? Who gets to decide that one? You do. You do. Make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous pr provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. Man, I got to do a lot. And self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and, and godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love for <laughs> everyone. <laughs> the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you'll be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I was just thinking about this just now. If God does everything, wouldn't he, want, wouldn't he do that for everybody? Like really super fast? He doesn't want you to cuss your neighbor out anymore. He doesn't want you to hate your neighbor. He wants you to love them, right? So if it's up to him, wouldn't he do it right now? But he doesn't, so... We're, on a, we're, all, we're all changing a little bit. Like you're, You may be changing quicker than I'm changing or vice versa, but it, if it was God doing it and he, and he wants you to love everyone, wouldn't he just make you love everybody? You know, because you know why it doesn't happen so fast for everybody? Because we're all involved. Because we're all involved. And so he says, uh, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you'll be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way, wait, 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 hold up, hold up. If God's doing it all, 
Would any of his kids fail? Would they? If he's doing it. If he's doing it, and he'll continue to do a good work to the day of Christ Jesus, right? You just got to sit there. He's going to do it all. He's going to do it all. But some of his kids fail to develop like this. But if God's doing it, would any of them fail? I would think not. I mean, I can understand if I fail. I can understand if you fail. I can understand if you fail, anyone in this room, but I, I can't imagine that God would fail. I don't think he's ever failed in anything that he's set out to do. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So you see, this is someone who's been cleansed from their sin. Is that a believer or not a believer? Who, show of hands, who thinks that's a believer? Right? But some believers will fail to develop in this way. They're not doing anything. They're sitting around waiting for God to do it for them, and it never happens. That's a problem. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard. It's not a salvation of works, but yet the Bible says work hard. Work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. So some are taught, some teach that, you know, God chooses whom he will to be saved. So if he chose you to be saved, why is he telling you to work hard to show it to the world? If he's doing all the, ch- if he saved you and he's doing all the changes, why do you have to work hard? It's just not, a, you understand why I'm getting, why I get frustrated with all that? Because this is what I've been taught my whole Christian life, but yet this is not what the Bible is teaching us word for word. I'm not making anything up. I'm just reading you what it says. I'm just picking it apart piece by piece. Do these things and you will never fall away. Now that seals the deal for me. Do these things and you'll never fall away. If you, they'll teach that if you've been saved, you've been sealed and you cannot fall away. But he's t- again, here's another Bible writer talking to people who have been cleansed of their sin, which only happens how? Jesus Christ. And he's telling them, you may fall away. You may fall away. But go on. Now remember, when Jesus Christ comes back, if you're not doing as you should, if you're not still under the lordship of Jesus Christ, if you still don't, if you don't, if you don't follow and believe all that you did from the beginning, you're going to shrink back in shame. But here's what Peter says. If we'll do all this stuff, then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm thinking red carpet right there, right? I'm thinking red carpet. I'm thinking... I'm thinking uh, the Oscars. I'm thinking I'm wear, you know, I'm not going to wear a gown. I'm wearing, I'm wearing like a Versace suit or something. But, but, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking grand entrance. How many people are are shrinking back in shame when God comes back to collect those that are really His? They're not shrinking back in shame. They're excited. There's my Jesus, right? Finally, did you guys ever see that picture on online? I haven't been on Facebook a couple weeks, but you ever see that painting? When you first see Jesus and it shows that girl and she's hugging his neck and she's just smiling like crazy. That's what it's going to be like. And no, one's going to, no one who's a real follower of Christ who loves him is going to shrink back in shame. Not if it's for real. Not if it's for real. See, fellowship, koinonia, partnership, and remaining in koinonia, partnership, fellowship, with the Son and the Father was never some intellectual endeavor of simply believing what the Bible teaches about the Father and the Son. It's just as much responding to it as it is believing in it. Okay? So watch this combo meal right here. You ready to be filled up with a combo meal? John 6, 29. Jesus said, the only work God wants from you. What? What? The salvation is not of works. And, and Jesus said, the only work that God wants from you ah, is to believe in the one that he sent. If it's a work of God who does it for you, then why is Jesus telling you that that's a work you have to do? Why? Because it's something you have to do. You have to make the decision to accept him as Lord 
and Savior. Okay, so, so but, but listen, that's just believing, right? So it's a work, I get it. It's a, it's a, it's a salvation of works and as such. But it's, it's just a belief. It's not really a do, right? So I get that. But isn't it true that on several occasions, Jesus Christ, the Lord, told people like Matthew, Peter, Andrew, follow me. He didn't say, just believe in me. What did he say? Follow me. That's lordship. Do as I do. Say as I say. Think as I think. Go as I go. Lordship. In Matthew 16, 24, he tells this to all of his disciples, it says. To all of his disciples. He says, quote, if any of you, these are his disciples. These are his disciples. Not just to the crowd. These are to his real disciples, his followers. If any of you want to be my follower, that, in other words, if you want it to be real, you must turn from your selfish ways. Some Bibles will say deny yourself. That's lordship. That means it's not, you're, you're not in charge anymore. Right? Your stuff that you want to do, that's not paramount anymore. Now it's what I want to do. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. This means you're not the Lord of your life anymore. Jesus is. And, and you can't just call him Lord, and you can't just call him Messiah. He's both. Remember Acts chapter 2, verse 36. God made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah. So proper relationship with Jesus Christ means that Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. And this is the most important two words. To you. To you. Okay? And listen, you, you, you could call him Messiah and, and, and hope he saves you all day and night. But if he's not your Lord, you get nowhere. And that's why it says in, in Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23, no, Many will come to me and say, Lord, 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 I prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, perform miracles in your name. Jesus said that the enemy can't cast out the enemy. You know that, right? So when you're, when you're casting out the enemies in, in Jesus' name, it can't be from the enemy. It has to come from who? From, from Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit inside. So when, I, when they cast him out in his name, it was the Holy Spirit that worked through them. And Jesus said, depart from me. You call me Lord, but you didn't know me. Knowing me means Lord and Savior. He has to be both in an abiding relationship. That means ongoing, never ceasing, without fading, all the time, enduring to the end. And you shall be saved. Luke 6, 46. I love this one. Jesus says this. Why do you call me Lord when you don't do what I tell you? Gut check, right? For all of us. I, I was going to give you a sermon prop and punch myself in the stomach, but I'm really not feeling well. And I'm just trying to get through the service. So this means that you have to believe it and you have to live it. See, a real Christian doesn't save themselves and a real Christian never tries to lead themselves. Remaining faithful in fellowship is just that. I never saved myself, you did. I'm not leading myself, you are. And that has to stay true today. Listen, go back. To the day you said yes, to today, to tomorrow, to next week, to next month, to next year, and during to the end. Right? And listen, this is... Many people during this sermon series have told me that when they left, they felt no hope. And I, I just want to say, I don't understand that. I see a people here, I see American people who are, 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 are gritty and tough and go get them. And when they see something they need, they go after it. You need more money, you go get a job. You go get a second job. You work hard, right? We work hard to, to get something, but yet in this when we say, hey, you've got to do something to have Jesus, you're like, I have no hope. Why, because you don't want to do anything? Like, let, let, this, let this inspire you to earnestly seek him. See, that's because that's what the Bible says to do. He says he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Right? Seek me with what? Your whole heart and you'll find me. Why is he telling you to do this if you somehow don't have to? And if you have to, then I have no hope. 
Hope is there. Hope is found in Christ. But you have to get after him. And he never blesses complacency. And he never blesses disobedience and laziness. That's, that's just not who God is. So this teaching of, of, of he'll, he'll sa- he's the one who chooses who gets saved. He'll do the saving. He'll do the changing. You just have to be a passive recipient. Look at this. It's all throughout the Bible that that's not the case. He says you need to do something. And if you don't, so don't go, oh, I'm just going to get cut off. No, 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 no. That's a lazy man talking. Get after it. Right? Get after Jesus. Right? Get after Jesus. He, let's, let's think about what he did. He went to the cross and he was whipped and beaten and killed and then, and then kicked the devil in the teeth and rose from the grave so that you could have eternal life. So get after it. Just like think about what he did to get after you. So how about you getting after him even greater than you ever have before? Even greater than you ever have before. That's what I hope would come out of the service like this. That you'd get after him even greater than you ever have before. Would you just, would you just consider that? Would you, not, would you have a holy discontent with the relationship that you have right now? Like, blessed that you have it, but a holy discontent that drives you to want more. I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more of you. I want to give you more of my life. Paul said, on behalf of the Holy Spirit, to give your bodies as a living sacrifice, that that, that type of worship is your reasonable worship. He said, I, I, could, I, could take, I could ask for more than that, but that's your reasonable worship. I'll take everything. I'll settle for 100%. If that's all you give me, fine, I'll take 100%. Don't show your hands. How many people are giving them 100%? I know I am not. But as I'm preaching this to you, I feel very, very inspired to get after him even more than I ever have before. And I hope that you'll join me in that. I hope our church, I don't know if it's ever going to fill up with thousands of people, but I hope that those of you that are sitting here would have a passionate, earnest pursuit of Jesus Christ from today, tomorrow, the next day, next week, next year. Let's do this thing together. Let's get after him greater than we ever have before. Let's have a new season here in our church of earnest pursuit, seeking him with your whole heart. Love me with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. That's what he wants. No more laziness, no more complacency, no more on the fence, no no more half-hearted effort, no more lukewarm. Let's get after him. That's what he wants. And and, and when you do that, I can't tell you what that's going to look like in your life, but I know it's going to be awesome. You, I know it's going to be awesome. Who would agree with me that if you went after him completely like you never have before, your life would be so much greater? Raise your hand. You, all of us do. But th- now it takes a matter of you making a decision of your will because he's, he's done it, right? He's given you the inspiration right now through a big old mouthpiece. He's told you that's what he wants. Now, guess what? He's still sitting there just like this right now. Let's see what you'll do, Robbie. Debbie, Roger, Mimi, it's not enough. It's not enough. No more easy gospel. Okay? Let's start with this. Let's give him a worship that you've, ne- that you've never given him before. Let's go. Come on, play a song. Let's, let's sing a song to him right now. Worship him like he wants. Like, what would, what would, what would passionate, earnest, pursuit of God sound like in this room right now if you've given him everything that you have.